Hi, I'm Liz Dyer. I'm the founder of the Mama Bears organization. It's an organization that's dedicated Thank to you. supporting and empowering families with LGBTQ members and the LGBTQ community. And this is my famous friend, Sarah Cunningham. She's the founder of Free Mom Hugs, an organization that is dedicated to empowering the world to celebrate the LGBTQ community through visibility, education, and conversation. And we are so excited to be here with you today. Thank you, Liz. We are so glad to, to be here. How many of you are familiar with the Mama Bears or the Free Mom Hugs? It's so good to see you. And those of you who may not may be hearing about us for the first time, thank you, uh, because I think this is going to be a great conversation. You know, Liz and I, we, am I yelling? I feel like I'm yelling. <laughs> and uh, I have a little bit of nervous energy. It'll go away in a minute, so don't mind. Liz and I have been friends for a long time. And we have many things in common, one of which we both have gay children. And we both had a, a challenging time when our children came out to us. And um, so we've spent the last few years spending time learning and re, uh, deconstructing our faith and reconstructing that. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And hopefully, if you just get one thing out of our conversation, that you'll, um, we might laugh, we might cry, but I hope that we all leave here uh, just feeling better about life and our spirituality and change. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah and I thought that maybe one of the best ways for us to talk about deconstruction of our faith and reimagining it was for us to have a conversation about our experiences. So we're going to be talking with each other, but keeping in mind that really this conversation is for all of you. So when my son came out, uh, it really rocked my world. I came from a conservative Christian background, and at that time I had always been told and taught and believed that it was wrong to be gay, and that it was wrong to have a same-sex relationship. Um, as a loving mom, I wanted to make sure that I had all the information that I needed to be a good mom to my son and to guide him in the right direction. So I began to look at you know, the Bible and all those things that were used to condemn LGBTQ people and same-sex relationships. And that was really the beginning of my process of deconstructing my faith. I didn't know it at that time. I didn't know that word. But that was when I began to deconstruct. And it was a scary time. Um, you know, I was asking questions I'd never asked before. And I was also afraid for my son. It was really disconcerting. Lots of emotions going on. What was it like when Parker came out to you, Sarah? Yeah, when Parker came out, I felt like, and I say it all the time, when Parker came out of his closet, I went into mine. And I had to re-examine everything that I believed because I was frozen in this fear, um, number one, of what his life would be like. He um, took a stand as a gay man when he met someone, and he tried to come out his entire life. But when it was official, when I had to face the reality that I have a gay son, I had to re-examine what I believed, why do I believe this, and it was a scary time for me. Um, I didn't know where to look for resources. I thought I was the only mom with these crazy thoughts in my head. I would fear for what his life would be like, but really I was frozen in this fear about his spirituality. I was afraid that he was going to burn in hell for eternity, and I was frozen in that fear. Now, Liz, were you ever afraid of of losing your faith or what was scary about it to you? Yeah, I think, you know, that's one thing when we talk to people about deconstruction, a lot of people talk about how scary it is and the fears that they have. And I think some of the fears I had was, of course, I was afraid for my son. What does this mean for his life? But also I came from um, a conservative Christian community that really didn't uh, value questions or, or doubts or even diving deep into beliefs. We were taught that certainty 
was a sign of mature faith and, and of a committed Christian. And if you had too many questions and doubts, maybe you weren't really a Christian, you know? And so, yeah, there was this fear that, you know, I was gonna lose my faith and, or that I had lost my faith. I, I was really afraid to do this. And yet, because I had this thing going on in my life that was so important, I had to do it. So yeah, I really was scared. And I do think that's something that, you know, a lot of people deal with when they are going through deconstruction. Um, did you, you said you were afraid for Parker. Did you also, were you afraid for your faith or losing community? That's another thing that we go through. Yes, suddenly it, feel, it felt like, uh, well, first of all, you should know that we belong to a church family for 20 years. We were there every time the church doors were open, Sunday, Wednesday, Falls Creek, uh, young musicians camp and all the rest. We had a wonderful fellowship there. We did a lot of really wonderful things. So when Parker came out, um, I felt like he suddenly to our church family was in need of fixing or broken or had uh, just was full, you know, like uh, say love the sinner, hate the sin kind of thing. Like he would suddenly had walked away from his faith. And I felt like I, that made me a bad Christian when my son came out, like maybe I had failed as a woman of faith. And uh, it was scary because my peers that I knew for 20 years, you know, suddenly I wasn't asked to pray at the women's Bible study. And I heard a quote recently, I don't know who said it, but it said the most powerful tool we can use against each other is our faith. And so I didn't feel like I was losing it, but it was, I was losing my witness is what I was fearful of, or that's how it felt. Um, now, I know you didn't lose your faith, but how did you hang on to it? Well, I think there were three main things that really helped me. Um, I can't put all the dates together, but I remember there was a quote by Richard Rohr that kind of set me on a different perspective. I felt like I was losing my faith. And then one day I read this quote where he said um, that no one progresses or goes forward or grows in their faith without going through a dark period of time. And that kind of made a little shift for me. It made me feel less like I was moving away from something, more like I was moving towards something. And it gave me more confidence um, to kind of keep diving in. Because, you know, one question would lead to another. You know, once I was kind of resolving what I believed about LGBTQ people and same-sex relationships, now I'm starting to think about all these other things that I believe. Why do I believe them? What are they based on? Um, you know, is that a valid belief? Is that really of God? So I had all these questions going on. Um, so that quote helped me. Also, um, I think one of the hardest things for me, and I, I was mentioning it earlier, is letting go of that certainty. And so one day I decided to sit down and really think about, was there anything that I could believe with certainty? I wanted something to hang on to. And so I came up with three things. I decided that I could believe that God is good because I'm not gonna follow God if I don't believe he's good. Mm -hmm. I believe that God loves everyone and I believe that God wants us to love each other. And those three things kind of became my pillars of strength and pillars of faith. And I hung on to those. Um, you know, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but to be honest, even today, those are probably the only things I still believe with certainty. But yeah, that really helped me. And then one other thing I would mention is I ran across a book called The Critical Journey let me see if I get the whole title here. The Critical Journey, Stages in the Life of Faith. Mm -hmm. And it talks about six stages of faith. And as I would read it through these stages and get to a certain point, which was after stage three and going into stage four, I felt like these people were reading my mind. So if any of you are around this afternoon or tomorrow, Sarah and I are gonna be in the combo tent and we're gonna be talking more about stages of faith so, faith. so you could join us there and we could dive into that. But yeah, those were the things that helped me a lot. Um, but you know, like we keep talking about, there's all these feelings with it. And even though these things were helping me, I still was dealing with a lot of 
fear and insecurity and loneliness. I mean, did you go through that? I mean, did you have a whole plethora of feelings? I did. I really did. Um, there was at one point when I was in my closet when the only prayer that I could pray is, Lord, let my understanding return to me. Because all the confidence and security that I had in our walk with the Lord, what we were teaching our children um, and raising our, our family, all of that certainty became uncertain. I went from one extreme to the other. And it was a process of being devastated, the loss of a 20-year church family, of becoming alienated from people that, that helped raise your children. Uh, it was devastating. And then um, I felt alone, for sure. I didn't know other moms like me. I thought I was the only mom in Oklahoma with a gay kid. And uh, I know, right? Um, <laughs> But then something happened. I went through a short period of where I was just cynical. Like, I wanted to just put a big banner on my front of my house and said, welcome to reality, or welcome to the real world, because I was questioning everything. So I became very aware. Uh, I did spend some time being angry and bitter, not understanding that our church, we just didn't know how to minister to each other. And then there was a, a time when I realized, when I became aware and the best word that I could think of is, I have been duped because I absorbed this idea about God that he would condemn my son for being gay. And so once I was aware and started finding the resources I need, and this is what I want you to hear me on too, is that the final stage for me was being accountable, being accountable to what I was learning and what I was experiencing by seeing my son live authentically, to meeting this beautiful spirit-filled community, and the, the laws even that affect them, I became accountable to those things. Now, Liz, what else did you do uh, to change your mind, or what else did you change your mind about besides the issue that we're talking about with the gay community and their relationships? Oh, yeah. Like I said, one question led to another, and so in some ways you could say I changed my mind about pretty much everything, but Rather than change my mind, I think more what I did was I unlearned a lot of things. You know, I unlearned my role as a woman. I unlearned my existence as a human being. I didn't continue to see myself as a sinner. I, I learned to see myself as someone who was created in the image of God and was good. You know, I learned that I had an equal place in you know, the faith community and in the world and in life and in relationships with men. Because, you know, in our conservative Christian community, there was kind of a hierarchy there. But not just men, even with teachers and leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, I became empowered um, through this process and that was really, really exciting. There are some things I don't believe in now that I did then. I don't believe in, um, you know, someone being tortured for eternity because they didn't say, you know, the right words or the right prayer or whatever that means to believe the right thing. Um, I don't know what I believe about some things. I mean, a lot of things I've just learned to embrace the mystery about, the Trinity, the virgin birth. I mean, I don't know. I learned to say, you know, we're speculating about a lot of this stuff and, um, I'm glad to talk about it, and, and it's a good conversation, and hopefully I'll continue to be enlightened, but I don't have to have all the answers right now. It's okay to say, I don't know. I like that. I like that. Um, let's see. Okay. And what about you? Same stuff. Yeah, uh, like you, I was raised to never question author authority. You don't talk about sex or money. I know. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you. The, the mom like me then, I once voted for a president for the sole reason they, they were friends of Israel. I know, I'm being very transparent here. Um, things that change, uh, obviously my thought process and getting uh, educated on laws that affect families like ours. Um, I don't necessarily believe in, I don't believe in hell. I think that was a scare tactic. Uh, I used to be rapture ready, right? It's like, Lord, <laughs> signs of the times, you know? I was rapture ready, and uh, but now 
I think, what if the rapture is really when just everybody gets it? When you can just love yourself and love yourself and love your neighbor. But that's what I think the rapture is. Um, there was a time, there were a couple of pivotal moments, if I may, two times I want to share you. One, early in my advocacy, I tried a process that I called together at the table, and that's where I would ask my conservative, non-affirming friends from the former church we belong to, to come to a table and I would prepare a meal and invite the gay community to have a conversation. It was called together at the table. The problem was I couldn't get any of my church friends, former church friends, to the table. It was like trying to make something happen. It was frustrating. It was disappointing. I was discouraged. I was just so frustrated. And then through the process of free mom hugs, we started just pouring into the community and their families. And it was effortless. It was, it was just pouring that love and that, all that energy into empowering the community, loving, being that loving presence to the community, and encouraging those families to have authentic relationships. Then it was, it was fruitful, it was empowering, it was lasting. I didn't have to make something happen. And an another thing is, early in this journey, I was invited to a drag show. And there was a little bit of my mind that thought, lightning might strike me as I walk through the door, <laughs> right? I was still kind of in that place. So I went to this drag show, and I didn't know what to expect. Um, but I saw a beautiful expression of human sexuality, gender identity. And they were raising money for a homeless shelter. It's like my eyes were wide open. I cried hot tears at a drag show because I saw this beautiful expression of humanity. It was the essence of humanity. And I'll never forget that day. From that day forward, I didn't think of anything perverted or anything that would be, um, you know, just, I don't know, all my for former thoughts would be, um, like it was perverted or something, but no, it was nothing but love, pure love and freedom, freedom to express yourself and um, help the community. And I was blown away. So, um, you yeah, that, that is beautiful. Um, and I think maybe one of the best things that comes out of deconstruction is this new vision that we have mm -hmm. about people, about other people, about ourselves and about God. Yeah, sure. And um, deconstruction isn't easy. Um, it, it's difficult, it's scary at times, but it's worth it. Um, because I think it helps us, you know, come away with um, a faith that is more real, more authentic, richer, and also transforms us in a way that um, helps us live and love better. Absolutely. And so I think that's really the point of deconstruction. Not everybody comes out of deconstruction still believing. You know, people have different paths. But no matter where they come out of it at, I always notice, I believe those people are living and loving better than they were before the process. And that's what's so beautiful about it. Yeah. Now, before we leave today, we want to leave you with some practical I don't know, advice, suggestions, ideas, thoughts. So Sarah and I have been talking about looking back on our process, what maybe some questions were, if we had had them then, that would have helped guide us through the deconstruction process and make it um, a little easier for us to keep moving forward. Because one of the things we hear from a lot of people going through this process is they get stuck or they get overwhelmed or they don't really know what to do, that, but they can't get out of the process and move forward. So we wanted to bring up some questions that might help you if you're going through deconstruction. So Sarah, what question, what's a question that you think would help? A question for me is when I had to re-examine what I believed is like, who is God? What did I know about God? Like you mentioned earlier, God is good. God is love. Those are things that I knew I could build a foundation. And if I didn't know anything else in the world, I know that God is greater than me. God is good. God is love. And God loves us. 
And so whatever's not in that vein or in that avenue or in that lane, I have to just stop and think for a minute. Is that of God? Is that of love? Is that empowering? Is that uplifting? And if it's not, then examine it. So you ask yourself, is that of God? Does that help? Maybe I love that. that. And yeah, um, I know I've even started to think there seems like there's, you know, a real division. There's one camp that is really looking at God as someone that we have to appease, yes. you know, and, and be great. fearful of. And then another camp that is really focusing on God loves us and he's in relationship with us and he, he's going to be with us no matter what, you know. So we don't have to focus so much on, you know, am I sinning? Did I do something wrong? Did I make a mistake? We can focus more on, okay, um, what is God empowering me to do? Mm -hmm. That's freedom. That's freedom, yeah. Um, also, I think we have to ask, who am I? Who am I in this world? Uh, and who am I in relationship to God? Um, I really encourage people, let go of this idea that your identity is that you're a sinner, that you're broken, that you are nothing without God, and really focus on the fact that you're created in the image of God. That works for me, maybe something else for someone else, but I do think that's a good question for people to ask early on in this process. Who am I? Who do I see myself as? I love that. I love that. Uh, one thing that was, um, I love scripture. I love the Bible. I love learning about um, just numbers and meanings of words and how the Old Testament mirrors the Old or the New Testament and how they mirror each other. And you can go as deep as you want in the word. And, um, you know, people used to say, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it or something like that. Well, there's so much more to that because now we know with scholars and theologians like Kathy Baldock doing the work, looking into who, um, who was writing the word, who it was written to, and what it meant in that context. I know you all know that. But what intrigued me the most about the Bible and how I'm able to look at it, because at some point, the Word of God was, uh, it was like it was, um, I don't want to say a condemnation, but it, I never could measure up to what the Word said. That was my mindset then. But now I see freedom there. I'm able to look at it in a lens where I see a beautiful living, and I do believe a, a living Word of God, and here's why. Uh, the Old Testament mirrors the New Testament, if you go to Genesis chapter 5, don't do it right now, but if you look at it, you'll say, God, why is this even in here? It's the most boring chapter in your, in your word. But it's Genesis chapter 5. It's the genealogy of Christ. And if you do a word study on every name in the order in which they go, guess what? It's the gospel. And this is Sarah phrase, but it says, the son of man comes down to a lowly world and brings good cheer. So that's paraphrased. But if you do a word study, so see how beautiful and profound the word of God is. So when you're in this place of freedom, where there's no condemnation, not in you, not in me, I am beautiful and spirit filled. I am free from shame, from, and it's not about being boastful, it's about being confident in who you are in Christ. So you're able to look at the word in the lens of love and examine it. And uh, it really is a beautiful thing. So that's what the Bible is, means to me. But at one time, it was, I felt like it was a tool to use against me. And now it's a beautiful tool that will empower me. Oh, I love that. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, after we find out, after we figure out what does the Bible mean to us, I mean, is it authoritarian, is it con condemnation, or is it, you know, something that can really feed into our lives in, in a positive way? I know one thing, um, you know, I had to get past believing that every single thing in the Bible was true because as I started asking all these questions, things weren't jiving. And then I got to the point where it's like, that's not the point. I can find truth in this story in this example, in this thought, whether it's factually true or not. So that was for me really important. Also, I had to ask myself, what is church to me? Um, you know, my experience was once I started going through deconstruction, I couldn't stay in my church. I could see it on people's faces. I could read it in their, 
uh, the tone of their voice that they were uncomfortable with the questions I was asking, with the thoughts I was having, with the, the changes I was making. And so the local church was not um, a good place for me to go through this process. Nowadays, maybe there would be more uh, progressive churches around my area that um, would be more receptive, but at that time they weren't there or I didn't know about them. And um, so the church for me became really more about the connection that I, and the relationship I was having with other people that were on a journey of faith. So, um, and the, I think the other thing that became um, evident to me, which I'd never thought about before, because I was someone like you, Sarah. I was in the church every time the doors open. I led women's ministry. I taught women's Bible study. I, you know, served on committees. I did it all. And to walk away from that felt wrong. But what I discovered is that God is at work just as much outside the local church as he is inside it. So I could still join God in his work whether I was going to a local church or not. So yeah, I had to ask myself that. What is church? And it, and it really ended up being a beautiful thing. Mm, I love that. Um, one question that Liz brought up is, who's your neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Uh, my neighborhood, everybody looks like me. And there was a time that I thought, well, that means I love my neighbor, literally. And I do, very much. But it also means that we must surround ourselves with people that look different than us. That maybe uh, think a little differently than, uh, you know, just people who are different than us. And that's your neighbor. And the one thing that I heard the most from the community as I were, were, uh, began to get involved is that they lost their sense of belonging at the, as they have been alienated from their families, from their church homes, and from many parts of society. They lost their sense of belonging. I believe that we all have, in the very core of us, a need to belong. And um, it reminds me of a word, I share it a lot, but it's Ubuntu. It's an African proverb and it means, what matters to you needs to matter to me. What brings you joy needs to bring me joy. What concerns you concerns me, it's Ubuntu. And um, I believe that's the essence of humanity. So think about your neighbor, look around you. If everyone looks like you, get out there as we can and um, just surround yourself with people who look differently than you do and it will enrich your life. Yeah, and I think, you know, that is another beautiful thing that you bring up, that deconstruction gives us the freedom to do that because in my conservative Christian community, people weren't even comfortable really, re you know, having relationships with atheists or agnostics or people who had, um, you know, embraced other faith traditions. And so until I went through deconstruction, I didn't have relationships with people who had different, you know, had embraced different belief systems. And that has really enhanced my spiritual life so much. I mean, I have a friend who's an atheist and, um, you know, I'd be careful saying this, I wouldn't want to offend her, but she's more like Jesus than a lot of Christians I know. <laughs> So uh, one last question that I think, you know, can really help us is to ask ourselves, what does it really mean to love God with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind? Um, you know, when I was in conservative Christianity, it seemed like that idea was connected a lot to um, sacrifice and self-loathing and, and submission. And I don't know, I'm not saying there's not a place for some of that, but now, for me, loving God with all my heart and my soul and mind is all wrapped up and integrated with how I love other people. And, you know, am I being love in the world? Am I, um, you know, speaking in a loving way? Am I behaving in a loving way? Am I even allowing myself to be loved by others? I think that's part of loving God with all of ourselves is also not just loving others, but allowing us ourselves to be loving because to me it really is about the relationship. Okay, before we wrap up, 
we're going to talk about a few other things that can help people move forward. And these wouldn't be questions, but these are things that, you know, we want to incorporate in the process that, you know, would help us. So what do you think, Sarah? Well, I think that community may be the most important thing. Uh, my first real picture of community on this side of our story is when I found the private online Facebook group for moms with gay kids. At that time, there were 250 moms in the group. And we all had the same story of being alienated from our families, from our church homes, and from many parts of society. Now, there were 250 moms in the group, and I remember a day that a woman, a mom came in the group, and you know how, if you're on social media, and she typed, my kid just came out, and I don't even know how to breathe, I don't even know how to pray. And 250 moms attack that thread and say, then you don't. You let us breathe, and you let us pray for you. And that was the most beautiful sense of support. Um, so community, finding people who've gone through, uh, surround yourself with people who who understand and will support you through a difficult time because we're here and community. You're not alone and you weren't created to be alone, so. Yeah, and there's no greater community than Wild Goose, right? right? I mean, that's why we love being here. This is the best. <clears throat> I would also say that um, it's important to rest, to take a break when you're deconstructing. Try to get to a place where instead of always needing to ask the question and find the answer, that you're living more from a place of curiosity. Um, you don't have to have all the answers. Um, you can embrace the mystery. You don't have to work at this 24 hours a day. And I know that can be hard because when you're coming through this process, sometimes it's on your mind constantly. But really work at taking a break and, and getting away from all the questions and, and letting things flow, because sometimes a lot of answers will come to you in unusual ways. Um, when you're not really thinking that you're seeking it, you'll have that aha moment. Yeah, speaking of aha moments, this is, um, I want to share two things with you, if that's all right. Um, is it Vivian, Vinny? The woman we just prayed for and we, that we, you introduced us to. Vanny? Vanna. Thank you, Vanna. That story just got me to the core. My sister um, recently, last year, passed, uh, and I was able to stay with her for three months. And we're talking about grieving, allowing yourself to grieve. You talk about grieving. I grieved the day I remember exactly where I was on the day that she called me and told me she had been diagnosed. I started grieving right then and there. And all that to say, and I'm gonna get through this because I want you to hear me. When I was grieving, the most profound grief would strike like lightning. And it would consume me, even if it was just for a moment. And it happened a lot. But one thing I, I noticed is that I, this is gonna sound really weird, but I, I felt energized. Like I really was being struck by lightning because it's a grief, it's a something that just gets you to the core. And I don't know, it's just the very depths of you and it's energizing in the way like you would be energized. Uh, those of you who've gone through deep grief, I think you probably know what I'm talking about. But it was something like being able to see the good that can come from it. It just, you're alive. You're alive and you're feeling and experiencing something so deep down. And I was grateful to have that, ex that feeling in me because I felt alive. And then on this journey, there was a time when I thought that was good for then, but this is good for now. What we went through as a family, we had some really wonderful experiences there with those people. And I don't ever want to, you know, it was just we didn't know how to help each other. But this is good for now. There's a mom out there like me then who needs a mom like me now. So put it in perspective. See light at the end of the tunnel. And by light, I mean there's lightning there. And 
that was good for then, this is good for now. I love that. So yeah, I would say that when you are deconstructing, there is grief to go through. So allow yourself to grieve. Um, it's okay. It's okay to take time to do that. And I think, you know, that is part of the process. Um, and then allow yourself to dream. Uh, dream of a new way to live your faith out. Reimagine what it means to be a Christian. Um, Brian McLaren's here today, and I have to thank him for early in my journey inspiring me to imagine a new way to be a Christian. Um, I love his early book, and uh, it really helped me a lot. It, it made me think of things that I would have never thought of on my own. Um, but there are a lot of connections you can make today that will help you think about God in new ways and think about what it means to be a follower of Jesus and uh, someone who's living into the way of Jesus and joining God in the work that he's doing today. And maybe one of the best things about deconstruction is it really helps us um, be more present now. Um, I think one of the best things that I let go of was thinking about the afterlife, about eternity. And now my faith keeps me very present in the moment. And, and I think that's one of the best things. Yep. I often say I'm so glad to be on this side of the story with you. Um, this is the part where I encourage you and remind you that you are beautiful and spirit-filled, each and every one of you. And when you can look at another person and say, you are beautiful and spirit-filled, to recognize that in each other, uh, the importance to remember that you have the power within you to be your own guide and encourage everyone to stay focused on spirituality, on your relationships, and there is freedom here. There is freedom here. There is no condemnation, no shame. And um, I recently had an interview with CBS, and I didn't realize it at the time, but at the end of the interview, the interviewee said, you know, Sarah, every obstacle that you faced is what you heard from other people, how they imposed their... Um, well, I was listening to what people said rather than what, what I was hearing, what I was experiencing from God. But everything good in this journey that's been fruitful and beneficial and empowering to not only our family but to others, I got an impression. I heard a still small voice, if you will. And those things have been the very best things in my life and in the lives around us. And I think there, that, that's a picture of freedom. And Liz, you recently shared with me an excellent poem. I want you to share it because I want you to listen to the words here and see the journey. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, um, we're gonna close with this uh, thought about breaking free and uh, going on your own journey of faith, your own spiritual path. This is called, It Was Almost Enough to Make Me Stop Believing. De facto segregations, emotional manipulations, personal salvations, all that proclamations I had taken the bait, walked through the narrow gate, learned what to hate, and I was certain of my eternal fate. I could spew the Roman road, so proud, so bold, part of the fold. I believed what I was told. I'm in, you're out, no doubt what I'm talking about. I know I'm right, I'm the one walking in the light. You lose, I win, come on, I'll point out your sin prostituting every opportunity, wanting to be the supermajority, working to oppress homosexuality. Don't forget about being offended by profanity. Let's hang out in our Christian bubble. Let's try to stay out of trouble. Don't wander away from the holy bubble. Forget about conversation. Debate for domination. Practice your presentation and talk about eternal damnation. 
pick a verse to justify being chauvinistic, deny it when they say you are legalistic, preach a gospel that is individualistic, forget that it seems a little imperialistic. Don't question the authority, know what's a priority, don't worry about the minority, that's our expository. The Christianization, the dehumanization, the demonstration, the incorporation made me start to question. What about the brotherly love, the justice that was spoken of, the one we were in awe of, and the mercy they talked of? Didn't they get the memoranda that we were supposed to love with no agenda? Didn't they notice the lack of transformation, the absence of civil conversation? Weren't we supposed to be known for our fruits instead of our refutes? Weren't we supposed to make the world a better place, full of love and hope and grace? Where was the creativity, the spirit of generosity, the chance for serendipity? Thank God I broke free, because it was almost enough to make me stop believing. Thank you all. Thank you.